In order to get uh, CNEs for this, you just need to view the entire session and then complete the online post-destin evaluation to get your CNE certificate. Um, I've already loaded it into the chat, so you can just copy and paste it. If for some reason you aren't able to copy and paste it out of the chat, just let me know. Email me and I will just send you the link right away. And with that, I'm going to hand this over to Jen. Hi, so back again, um, we're going to go ahead and talk about how to make you experts in sea collars. Again, Cindy and I have no conflict of interest um, with what we're going to talk about in this lecture. Um, I am Jen Fritzine. I'm the trauma and burn program manager. My uh, experience, bedside experience, is mainly pediatric intensive care and transport. Um, I've spent some time working and being an educator on a burn unit, and I worked here in the emergency department for several years before going into uh, trauma administration, which I've been for 11 years. Uh, Cindy is our injury prevention, education, and outreach coordinator. Cindy was a paramedic before she was a nurse, and as a paramedic, she worked uh, in the field as well as on transport. And as a bedside nurse, she was a PICU nurse until I stole her um, to come work for us. So three giraffes. How many cervical vertebrae do you think a giraffe might have? 50. Someone said 50. 50. Okay, we got 50. Wow. Anybody else? Anybody else have anything other than 50? 75. 75. Yeah, so we all can agree they have a really long neck, which could potentially have a lot of cervical vertebrae. Now, Here's the interesting thing, even though they have all those cervical vertebrae, or all those, that really long neck, they only have seven cervical vertebrae. They're just really big vertebrae. Now, my next question is, almost all mammals have seven cervical vertebrae. There is only two mammals that do not. Does anybody want to take a guess of which two mammals that would be? If you get this right, you get two extra hours. Just kidding. <laughs> What was that? They said a cat. <laughs> a cat? You one would think it would be a cat because you know they always kind of do things their own way. Not a cat. Uh, manatees and sloths do not have seven vertebrae. They can have anywhere from six, seven, or eight vertebrae. Just interesting. Now. Here's the good news about what we're going to talk about right now is the fact that cervical spine injuries are generally not that common in children. It, not that it can't happen, we just don't see it a lot. Children less than eight years old, though, are more susceptible to C-spine injuries than any place else within the spinal column, mainly because they have a big head compared to their body proportion, and that big head is really heavy, and they have a weak neck. And so if, when you have a big, heavy bowling ball sitting on a little weak neck, um, you can see how your cervical uh, vertebrae and your cervical tissues could take some hit. Um, so what we see in a lot of our kids is we see a lot of ligamentous injury versus not necessarily spinal cord injury. Because if you think about young children, everything in a young child is stretchy, and that does include their spinal cord. Now, another thing that causes them to have higher C-spine injuries is just those immature joints at the ossification centers, um, facilitating that sliding of that uh, upper C-spine. Now, kids get C-spine injuries. We see them in motor vehicle crashes. This is actually a common place in which kids are going to come in with cervical tenderness. Kids can fall out a window, land on their head, land on their neck. Sports injuries, we see a lot of football players. We've seen, um, I've actually seen some basketball players with some cervical injuries um, taking, you know, getting hit as they go up for a jump shot and end up landing on their neck. Cheerleaders, competitive cheerleaders are coming in with cervical injuries. So a lot of our different sports and the kids getting hit by cars. One of the biggest things we see with cervical injuries in young children is our kids that are shaken. Those kids that are shaken um, as a form of abuse, somebody's taking them and, you know, really give them a, a, a good shape. That neck, you're going back and forth, um, and that puts some strain on the cervical spine. Now, another place that we really see our kids getting some cervical injuries is, like I said, motor vehicle crashes. 
So why is it so important for kids to remain rear facing until they're at least two years old, but AAP now is starting to say three years old? What's the advantage of sitting in that car seat rear facing? Anybody? Their spines aligned. Their spinal line, yeah, first of all, you're in that five-point harness that takes the PhD to figure out. And those kids are in there, and they are really in there nice and snug, kind of like in their own little cocoon. But the other thing is, is when you are in a car crash, most car crashes happen going forward. And so if you are sitting facing forward, your, your head's going to snap forward first and then backwards. If I have a child sitting front-facing, that's going to happen with them. You front facing, they're going to have that head on collision, that big head, weak neck, it's going to snap their head forward really fast with all that energy of the car stopping, and it's going to cause them a cervical injury. When you're sitting rear facing and you have that head on collision, what happens is the collision happens and the baby's head goes back into the car seat. So it can kind of slide down that energy and slow them down a bit before coming to a stop where their head goes forward. So with kids sitting rear-facing, we see a lot less C1, C2 injuries. If they're front-facing, we're going to see C1, C2 injuries, and really it can be an internal decapitation. So what, here are different kinds of C colors that we can use. Um, you might see them come in. These are kids, uh, the blue and yellow one, this might be something you see from EMS. Um, the other two are ones that you might see from kids transferring in. Um, uh, one's an aspen collar. What we use here for more long-term uh, collars is the Miami J. Now, when we look at a Miami J, there's a top and there's a bottom. And I know this sounds silly that I'm going to tell you guys top, bottom, front, and back, but we have seen it done wrong in every way imaginable. Now, when I look at these, um, there's actually an arrow no, you can't see mine, but, oh, you might be able to see it. You can see an arrow pointing up, pointing towards the top. Obviously, opposite of the top is going to be the bottom. The front, it actually says front on it right here. And you can see it circled on my screen. And the back, it, do, it actually says back. When I flip it backwards down here, it says back on the bottom. So top, top bottom, front, back, important to notice. Now, your cervical spine or your spinal column, you have seven cervical vertebrae, you have 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar, five sacrum, and four coccyx fuse. People often forget about the coccyx fuse. And we can have traumatic injuries any place within this. Now, our Miami J is going to be really good when we're talking about those cervical vertebrae. It's going to take different types of orthesis when we have kids with injuries elsewhere. Now, here's our little peanut coming in from a car crash, getting hit by on a bike, whatever. I guess she's looking for a bike. They have these big heads. So what I want you to look at is if I just lay this child on a bed or on a stretcher, look at how her spine is aligned. And here's how a normal spine alignment is going to be. And so it's going to be very important with these kids with these big heads, all of our kids under eight, to be able to put something under their shoulders so that big head can go back and we can have normal spine alignment. And you can see how that happens with the pictures. So getting the right fit. We have to size it up, we have to scoop it up, and we have to snug it up in order to get a seat collar on correctly. Now sizing it up, we have cards that, um, Cindy, I believe we can get the cards to them or do they have cards? Um, I had given Teresa quite a large handful the last okay. time that I taught, but I can order more if needed. Okay, so if you need cards, we'll get you cards, but if Teresa has some, you might already have them in your possession. And this really tells you what size C color you need for different age child. And 90% of the time, these ages work perfectly. So if I have an eight month old, I'm gonna pick a P1. If I have an eight year old, I'll pick a, a P3. And we always wanna make sure that the front and the back are the same. You have a P1 front, you have a P1 back. The only time that this is different is for P0. You have a P0 front and you will have a P1 back. I don't know why the company does that. It's basically just to confuse us, but it works. So we've identified the size. Now we're going to have to scoop it up. This is how to put 
CDC Colorado. I am going to do the best I can to show you from my home office here. So what we're going to do is you're going to slide the back teeth behind the child's neck. Um, and this is when they're laying down, you can kind of scoop it behind them. Somebody holding C-spine might be able to help lift the head a little bit. Now we're going to pretend that's on my back. We are then going to take the front of the collar. And we're going to flare out the side and you're going to slide it up the chest. And you can see that scoop that happens when I slide it up the chest. <laughs> and fun in it. Then we're going to snug it up. We're going to curl the end snugly against the child's neck. And we are going to tighten these straps to the back one at a time. And remember, we want glue on glue. And so I have my glue on the front. And it should match the glue on the back. Now, if any of you have put a C-collar, and you can see um, in these pictures, I've had many PICU nurses in C-collars. Um, it's not the most comfortable thing. It should feel nice and snug. If a kid is able to talk to you, they should tell you it's a little bit tight. Now, it shouldn't be tight where it's cutting off circulation, but it should be nice and tight, and they should not be able to move their head around. If I have this on correctly, I have the front of it on correctly, you can see I have minimal movement, and I can't move my head up and down. So here's just some pictures of what it should and shouldn't look like. You can see in A, the top, um, that kid's going to be able, his chin isn't in there. It's not snug on his chin. He's going to be able to move. If you go down, you can see the one below him, it's a nice snug fit. B is a color that doesn't fit. If it is sticking out like this, and above my chin, I'm going to be able to move, and I'm not going to have good alignment and good support. <laughs> and um, we probably can all laugh at this, but I'm going to hand this over to Cindy, and she's going to show you some real problems that we have had within the walls of our hospital when it comes to sea collars. Okay, this part I'm going to ask um, quite Everybody can see my screen, right? That is... Yeah. Jen. Yeah. Okay, and I'm not muted, so that's good. Okay, so um, this this picture did not happen in our hospital because he's a little old. <laughs> but the important thing is to remember is don't do this. Please do not let this happen. And if you see a C collar on a patient that is not um, put on correctly or is not holding the neck stable, please help out and help anybody fix it. Okay, so who can tell me what is wrong with this C-collar? Uh, <laughs> okay, it's too big. You're right, it's too big. It's way too big. So the chin is down here, and this is all the way up here. So this happened when a child came back from getting a procedure done and they took the C collar off in order to do the procedure and then they put it back on incorrectly. Also, does anybody else see anything else wrong with this other than it being like way too big? So they also still have the sternal pad on there. So every C collar comes with this sternal pad and this, when any patient that's lying prone or who is going to be in bed and not up and moving around with the C-collar on, this pad needs to be removed. All right. So these are a little bit fuzzy. These are taken with cameras that, were, does, that don't have the best clarity. But who can tell me what's wrong with this collar? It's not straight. Okay, it's not straight. There's something else that's really big, really wrong with it. Upside down? Yes, it is upside down. So see, that's where the, the scoop of the neck is and that's the bottom part. That is not right. So you can see here is the patient on the bed and you can see, I feel like you can maybe see a little bit more clearly that this is upside down. So whenever we're doing C-collar care or putting on a C-collar, a good practice to get in is looking at it and going, reading 
the word front, reading the word back, and looking where those arrows are going, because you do not want to do this. Now, is this better? Yeah. Is there anything wrong with this one? We went from here to here. And the reason why the team noticed that it was upside down, it was a nurse that said, hey guys, we have the C collar on upside down. So again, never be afraid to say, hey, this doesn't look right to anybody who's putting a collar on anyone. And again, now we're back in the right place. Okay, what's wrong with this one? <laughs> Back. Yeah, it's the back. So the back is on the front. So again, when Jen was saying, you know, this looks, this it may sound silly to say, this is the front, this is the back. It, these things do happen. So if you're not paying attention, it's easy to put the back on the front and the front on the back. Another way that I like to remember what is the front and what is the back is the front has a hole in the front of it. The back doesn't have a hole. And I always think like, if I had a patient with a trach, would this work at all? No. So you always, the part with the hole in the front is the front. Now, when you get to the larger size collars, the ones that don't have P, so they, the Miami J's also come in sizes of like short, tall. These are kind of the adult sizes or in the teenage sizes. Um, the backs also have a hole. So you can't always use that as your, your test of, are you putting the um, right part of the collar in the right place? But they are always labeled front and back. So I was just, please get in the practice of always reading before you place the collar. Is that holding a good C-spine for that child? Does that look like it's helpful at all? No, it's, it's, it's not at all. I mean, and this child did not come in with neck pain but he ended up having neck pain because his collar was on incorrectly. <laughs> All right, what's wrong with this one? Backwards. Uh, backwards. What's wrong with this one? The pad is still on. Oh, yeah. Say that one more time, please. The pad is still on. Okay, the pad's still on, but when we go and we think about the three steps, so size it up, scoop it up, and snug it up. So it wasn't scooped because you can see the sides that are flared out. So that it didn't scoop because those sides are supposed to be right along the neck. And when we say snug it up, we don't have blue on blue. This made an X. That should never make an X. This is the, this is the proper placement. So you can see that the sides are nice and um, aligned around the neck, and now we have blue on blue. See the difference of the improper placement versus the proper? Okay, so a couple strange but true facts. And Jen said this earlier, that whenever you are putting on a collar, and you would, this isn't a problem when you first put on the collar, because if you take the collar out of the package, you have a front and a back, and they should match because they came together. However, when you put the PO collar, it's a, it has a PO front, but the back says P1. So the fronts and the backs of all of the collars are labeled, but again, the PO collar has a P1 back. Again, we don't know why they do this. We have called the manufacturer, we have talked to them, and their initial response was, really? It does? Which, that was a little concerning to me. However, that is, it's just the way it is, and the PO collars have a P1 back. So don't be worried. And then we have the papoose. So the papoose is for children ages zero to three months. And this is how it comes packaged. Now it comes packaged and I feel like it comes packaged in a way that sets our people up to fail. Because this right here, this is where the ears of the patient go. So see how there's this nice groove right here. This is where the head goes. And this, the collar, the neck piece, actually goes here, but it's packaged this way. So when you get, if you open up a papoose package, it's packaged this way, but that is not how you put it on. See, this is the correct placement of the papoose. 
Now look at the packaging. That is confusing to me. However, we do not want to put this on improperly because if you think about it, if you put this collar up here, you'll the arms will be going where the ears are. And that is not what we want to happen. However, it does happen and it has happened in our hospital. So this is baby Holly. And we put her into our papoose and note her ears are where that groove is. And see the, you can also see where the head's supposed to go and then the rest of the body. Notice we have, it says ears. Okay, so what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> yeah, the arms are where the um, ears are. So we do, the arms are where the ears should be. And the front, the collar is right up on the head. So again, that's where the ears need to be. But can you see how it happens? Because the ears do fit in that area. And then this kind of wraps around the body nicely, but that is not the correct way. And that does nothing for the C-spine. Is there anything supporting this kiddo's neck at all? And then his head's just kind of out there flopping around. So we do not want to do this. That's what, that's, and again, that's a front view of baby Holly. All right, so I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, once upon a time, we had six trauma patients in the PICU, and they had a total of 16 pressure ulcers. Um, the locations of these pressure ulcers were on the chin, the shoulders, the occiput, and the ears. What do you think all of these patients had in common? Somebody say they all had C collars on? Yeah. Okay, well that you are you are absolutely correct. So our goal in general is to have no pressure ulcers ever. And we do not want to put any device on a patient that could cause any harm. So our goal is to not have any pressure ulcers from these C colors ever. So I'm just gonna show you a few pictures of um, pressure ulcers caused by C collar. So this is from the occiput, you know, that back piece on the chin the shoulder. Now again, this the shoulder, that's where that breakdown is from. What's this? It's nothing to do with the C collar, but what is this right here? We talked about it in the previous lecture. Yeah, yeah. So that's like the battle signs caused by the basal or skull fracture. So how do we prevent getting these pressure ulcers from the C collar? So we need to offload the pressure points. So you want to limit the time that patient is supine. Now, I understand that that sounds ridiculous because they're in the PICU, so they're going to be in bed. When we say limit time that patient is supine, that just means turning frequently and adjusting the tilt of the bed. So if you have the bed that is, you know, we'll just say horizontal, but then you have like the head up just, um, you know, up to 30 degrees if you are intubated, you can adjust the tilt of the entire bed. Um, and afterwards, if you guys don't know how to adjust the tilt of the entire bed, please ask one of your educators to show you exactly how to tilt the whole bed. Um, just doing, changing that tilt of the bed every, and Jen, how many, how often were we doing it with our one patient that had, um, that was paralyzed from her injuries? How often were we changing that? Was it like every 15 minutes we were just changing the tilt a little bit? Yeah, we were, we were adjusting the tilt between every 15 minutes and 30 minutes. Um, and yeah. it was just very, very, very slight. But even those slight changes, whether it's side to side or tilt of bed, is going to offload pressure points. I think it's really interesting. Does anybody know how often you change or uh, change the way you are sitting or standing to offload pressure points? You actually change your position every 15 to 30 seconds in order, whether you know it or not, in order to not have pressure points uh, be affected. And, you know, it's nothing for us to wait every two hours to change the position of our patients. And um, some of these kids just are not, with their seat color on, they're not gonna be able to go two hours without having some type of breakdown. Absolutely, and a lot of the patients that we have in the PICU, they are um, hemodynamically unstable. 
So they're already having issues with their perfusion. And then you add in not moving them until, unless it's every two hours. And we're not talking about big moves here. Again, we're just talking about like a slight tilt. So that is like one of the way, an easy way we can combat um, pressure ulcers in this population. And then we can also maximize the padding of skin around the vulnerable points of the collar. So our vulnerable points were the occiput, the chin, the shoulders, um, and also the chest. So again, we talked about this a little earlier about removing the sternal pad. So P1, P2, and P3 collars come with a sternal pad attached. This should always be removed if the child is not mobile or sitting up in bed. So most of the patients in the PICU will, uh, most of the patients in the PICU will have this removed. But if we have a patient um, in a C collar in surgical care, they'll probably need this because those children could be moving around a lot more. And when we send patients home from the hospital in the C-collar, they need this because it helps with the, um, with the fit when the child is sitting up straight. So when we say maximize padding, so we can use Mepilex border. Mepilex border can be added to the chin, the shoulders, the ears, and the sternum, and that's underneath the collar. And then for the occiput, we have elastigel. Um, for my PICU people, where do where's the elastigel kept? Yeah, the supply closet. Good. <laughs> in the cage, and the, and the cage is generally locked. We all know that the charge nurse has that key. Um, however, I will say that. Um, I, I have done the thing where you like stick your hand through the cage without the key and like you kind of like sneak it out. So that is a way to get it if you can't find the key. Um, where does Mepilex border live in the PICU? And Cindy, just so you know, Elastigel's in bare bins now too. It's not in the cage anymore. Oh, that's great. In bare bins. All in the 903 room by Maine. That's fantastic. Okay, so is that where the Mepil exporter is as well? Yep. All right. Okay, so now we're going to talk about C collar care. So, how often does C collar care need to be done per shift? Once a shift. Once a shift, that's correct. So before you do C collar care, and what you want to do during C collar care is you're going to take off the collar. You're going to remain holding C spine while you're taking off the collar, while the collar is off. You want to inspect the skin, make sure that you have padding in all of those special areas. So the shoulder, the neck, the chin, the occiput. You want to clean the area, clean the collar, and then put on another collar. So this ne the skin needs to be inspected once a shift. So you want to gather your team. So how many people does it take to change a C collar appropriately? Three. So a minimum of three because, and it all depends on how big the child is and <clears throat> if they are in a papoose or if they're intubated or if they're intubated and have an ICP monitor. So a minimum of three but um, it, it always a minimum of three, and then you may need more people. Um, who is in charge of all of the movement the, in, during this entire time of looking at the C collar, looking at the neck? Who's in charge of all movement? Correct, the, the nurse holding C spine. Exactly, so the nurse holding the neck <clears throat> excuse me, the neck and C-spine. So that person is always in charge. So um, the one time where it can kind of get tricky is if the patient is intubated because most of the time it's the person with the airway that is always in charge of any type of patient movement. So the person, ho person holding C-spine and the person holding the ET tube, they will be the ones coordinating with each other to give direction to the rest of the team. Know what is happening here? Hold on. Okay, so um, 
for when you to document this, the where you document it is under neuro detail. A lot of people think that we should document under ADLs, which makes sense. However, Cerner has this under neuro detailed. So you go to neuro detailed, and then at the bottom where you can um, open this up, it says cervical collar, and you can say you removed it, you changed the pads, the skin was intact, and then you can um, also check other if anything happened during that was eventful during the time where you were um, doing your collar care. Okay, so what happens if your patient dies whenever you touch them? Notice on the screen, our ICP is 60. So if you're happy and do not have a high ICP at all, and then you go in to do C-collar care and it rises to 60 and your blood pressure tanks, everything tanks, what do you do? Do you have a physician write in order to not do C-collar care? Do we do that? No, we never do that. Do we write our own order now that I showed you how to put in orders for the Get Well Network? Can you write your own order saying not to do C collar care? No. So you would never do that. Um, and the reason why I am like kind of like honing in on this point is we have had people do this. We have had people get our poor unknowing residents write orders that say do not perform C collar care. That is not the right thing to do. What we will do is document, document, and document. So in that one area where it said other, you can document right there saying unable to change C-collar due to ICPs going over a certain number. So again, skin never comes before airway, but it's very important to make sure that you document why you couldn't do the C-collar care. Um, this patient was in our hospital and did not have a C-collar on, but he was extremely unstable anytime that we touched him. So he was on his back for a lot longer than he needed to, that, a lot longer than was appropriate. But every time that we touched him, he decided to uh, not do so well, but he ended up with a uh, pressure ulcer on the back of his occiput because of that. Um, I'm going to move this over to Jen and she's gonna talk to you about how do we get these C collars off? Because as soon as you get a patient with a C collar, the first thing you think of is how, we want to get this thing off because we do not want to have to be doing all the C color care every shift. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, how do we get this collar off? Who's clearing this uh, C spine? Well, here's our cervical spine clearance algorithm. Now, look at it. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to look at it, and there's a test at the end. Everybody got it? Don't worry about it. Um, this is actually located in the trauma manual. It's not necessarily important that you know all of the ins and outs of this, but this is how uh, the trauma team and the neurosurgery team are going to make decisions on how, who's, uh, whose collar we can clinically clear and who needs CT scan, who needs MRI. So it really gives our clinicians a nice guided pathway to know how to safely get that collar off. So people who are going to clear the collars are going to be neurosurgery or trauma. Um, and a lot of times neurosurgery will defer to trauma. If you need help, I have a kid in a C-collar. I think it's time to get clear. Nobody will come clear my C-collar. Um, my C-collar doesn't look like it fits. Um, any question, I need another set of hands. Um, you can always call one of the burn, trauma and burn nurse practitioners at 8212. Or again, like everything else, Cindy, myself, and Liz are available. Um, Pre-COVID, post-COVID, we are there Monday through Friday. Um, during this crazy time, one of us is there every day of the week, um, and we can be another set of hands to help you. There are also several resources. This is the Trauma and Burn Manual. It's in a purple binder. It is in the PICU. Jen, do you know where, or Teresa, do you know where your hard copy is located? They have three hard copies, one's on main, one's on neuro, and one's on east. The one in okay. east is in the integration room. The one on neuro is um, like where the Pixis, I don't know if the Pixis is still there if you went to Bear Bins, but um, that area where next to the med room. 
and on main it's right where the that front desk is right and they're big now if you can't again. find any of those you can get on the intranet and in the search function just type trauma, trauma manual and it will come up um, so it should be easily accessible the one online is very very up to date and then um probably once a quarter ish we we do any changes to the hard copy to make them up to date. Um, please feel free, feel free to reach out at any time when there's issues with sea collars. If you have questions, um, if you're concerned about a sea collar, or if you're just uncomfortable, um, we're happy to be there to help you. Um, and at that point, we can open up for any questions. And you can ask questions either by voice or through um, chat. And this lecture is made to go along with the hands-on portion of practicing putting on sea collars, taking them off, putting on the papoose, taking off the papoose. Um, for our in-person group with the PICU, um, I know that all of your educators are awesome and that they'll go through it with you. Um, again, if you are a nurse at the bedside and have a um, patient in a sea collar and you just don't feel like you got enough, you can always call one of us to come and help. Ah, so the question was, are the sea collars in bear bins on the unit or do we need to order them? Um, Cindy, do you want to answer this or do you want me to? Um, I, they are not on the unit. Um, they have to be ordered from Central Supply. Um, so most often you will have a patient come up from the emergency room in a sea collar. When you have a patient um, from the emergency room come up in a sea collar, you first want to make sure that it fits correctly, it's on correctly, it's not backwards, upside down. Um, it, they, any patient coming from the ER will still have that sternal pad attached because again, the ER goals is to figure out what's wrong and where do they need to go. They're not going to take off the pad um, and you don't want them to because then you'll lose it. Um, so I would take off the pad and then automatically whenever you get a patient with a C collar, call Central Supply and order your second one. Because when you do see collar care, you're going to take off one collar, you're going to clean those pads. And when you clean the pads, they're still going to be wet. So you want to put on that fresh collar that you got from Central Supply. Any other questions from you guys? No. All right, Cindy and Jen, thanks guys. We appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Um, Laura, Glenna, um, Diane, any questions while you're before we uh, turn off the... No, thank you so much. Okay, thanks for joining. Thanks.